LWT debates. Tonight, the race for Ohio's 8th Congressional District between Congressman Warren Davidson and Vanessa Enoch. Here now, Stephen Albritton. Good evening. Tonight we are bringing you the first in a series of live debates with the men and women who want to represent you in Congress. We start tonight with Ohio's 8th District, which covers Butler County as well as several counties to our north. Joining us is the incumbent Republican Congressman Warren Davidson. Mr. Davidson is an Army veteran and a graduate of West Point. He has a master's degree from Notre Dame and worked in the business world for about 15 years. Mr. Davidson has served in Congress since 2016 and is on the House Financial Services Committee. His challenger is Dr. Vanessa Enoch. She's a graduate of Ohio State, has a master's degree from Xavier and a PhD from Union Institute and University. Dr. Enoch is an expert in public policy and social change and has spent more than 20 years working to drive change in local communities. Welcome to both of you tonight and thank you for joining us. We do appreciate it. Now we have an hour for tonight's debate for what will hopefully be a lively discussion about the issues facing the people of Southwest and Western Ohio. We're going to begin with opening statements from each of you. Dr. Vanessa Enoch, by virtue of a coin toss, you have the first opening statement. You have a minute and a half. Thank you. Thank you to WLWT for hosting this debate. And for those of you who are viewing um, in the great state of Ohio, my grandmother and my mother had the greatest influence on me. They taught me to always do the right thing, to persevere, to work hard, and to rely on my faith and my values. It is because of those lessons from my mother and my grandmother that I started a business when my company, General Electric, became the first company in the United States to lay off workers and to, uh, ex to send those jobs overseas. Since my mother and my grandmother always taught us to have confidence and courage, this is what's compelled me to run for Congress. For the past 20 years, I have been fighting on the front lines for children from single parent households to ensure that they got an equitable education. Because I believe that children should not, their, how far children can go should not be determined by their zip code or by where they come from, the type of family they come from. I've also fought to ensure that veterans had rights, that people who have difficulties and challenges in life, that they have equal access to opportunity. All right, Dr. Enoch, thank you so much for your opening statement. Now on to uh, Congressman Davidson, your opening statement, a minute and a half, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank, thanks for moderating, and thanks uh, to the team at WLWT for putting this together. It's really just an honor to be here uh, with all these viewers tonight. And I want to introduce myself personally. I'm Warren Davidson, a member of Congress. I love this country with a soldier's passion. And I'm humbly asking for your vote in this election to continue defending freedom, to continue defending America uh, in Congress. You know, Steve highlighted my resume. I, I was a, an Army Ranger who enlisted in the Army after high school, earned the chance to go to West Point by a different route, and then got out of the Army and started and grew manufacturing businesses right here in Ohio. Uh, went along to pick up an MBA, uh, but apply that experience to serve in Congress. Look, our country is a great country. With hard work, earnest values, and the grace of Almighty God, Americans have built the greatest country to ever exist. It's an honor to serve in our House of Representatives as a, a member of the House Financial Services Committee to serve on the president's task force to safely reopen America, to defend freedom, to defeat our enemies, uh, to support our veterans, and to help grow our economy. So this election is uh, uh, an opportunity to choose wisely, to make sure that we have a republic, that we keep it that way, and we uh, move forward that makes America's brightest days the days ahead. All right, Congressman, thank you so much for your opening statement. Now we're going to move on to the question and answer portion of our debate. All of tonight's questions have been prepared by the WLWT staff, and neither candidate has been given any of these questions in advance. Each of you will have a minute and a half to answer each question. If I need to ask a follow-up, you will each be granted 30 additional seconds. By the way of the coin toss, Dr. Enoch, you are going to have the first question. We're going to start with the COVID pandemic. The President of the United States has just been released from the hospital, and a number of his 
advisors, U.S. senators, journalists, and White House staffers are sick with coronavirus. Without knowing how they contracted it, it seems to have been spread dramatically at a White House event where even modest precautions recommended by the CDC were ignored. No social distancing, very few masks. What is your take on the current situation and what do you advise the people of the 8th District about staying safe from the virus? A minute and a half. Thank you so much for that question. You know, it's, it's concerning that uh, our president has um, unfortunately contracted the cor coronavirus. Um, for those of us at home who have watched over the past several months, uh, we've watched the president um, on numerous occasions uh, to make fun of people who wore masks. And so I would encourage people uh, who are viewing to take the coronavirus serious. This is a global pandemic. It's a problem across the country. I've heard our congressman say that he encouraged the um, sheriff who said that, the sheriff um, of Butler County, who said that he wouldn't be the mask police. We would hope that responsible adults would need a mask police. But the reason why we have policies is to protect the public. And so I hope that people will, from here on out, take the coronavirus seriously. All right. Congressman, minute and a half, same question. Yeah, thanks for that. And it's just been encouraging to see the outpouring of support for our president uh, in his health situation, and frankly, all the people around the country because of his uh, high visibility case of coronavirus. I think a lot of people did take it more seriously than maybe they had. But I think the other part that the president's had a message along the way, you can't live in fear. You have to live your life. And, and it's a survivable condition. Uh, the media has created so much fear in the country that it's disproportionate with the amount of risk uh, to life and health. It is a serious public health crisis, but the approach thankfully has been more aggressive. It, the approach we had was designed for the fear that it was potentially gonna kill two million people. The reality is this virus hasn't proved that lethal. And for people in the president's age category, it's just under 95% of the people who happen to get it uh, survive. And then below that, everyone above that in my age category, 50 to 69. Uh, so it, it, it's 99.5% survival rate. For people just below that, 99.8%. And for kids 19 and under, 19 and under, 99.997% survival rate. So you shouldn't live in fear of it. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants to spread it to others. And I think reasonable safeguards make sense, uh, but you shouldn't live your life in fear. And just to follow up, you, said, you mentioned the reasonable safeguards. For you, masks or a mandatory masks, what, what should it be? Uh, look, I've gone to places where people have invited me, and before there were statewide mandates, businesses had various practices. I felt safe in every one of those situations, and I, I don't think that uh, nationwide or statewide mandates are merited. All right, Dr. Enoch, statewide mandates, what do you think here? You know, I think it's, it's concerning that um, the senator, I'm sorry, the congressman even um, would take 5% lightly. I'm not sure where those statistics came from, but I think scientists and medical professionals have been clear on the dangers of this coronavirus. I've lost five friends, one brother-in-law, and several people close to me. I wonder which of uh, Congressman Davidson's family members he wouldn't mind losing to this virus. 30 seconds. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control put this data out. And frankly, uh, that's the thing. You know, when you, when you were on the front end of this, when you looked at it on the front end, I had the same briefings that all the House had. And initially, when Congress had a hearing in February, uh, they used it to highlight uh, their attacks on the president and to skew the information. It's been hard to get facts out, so people are still reacting uh, to this virus in a way that isn't proportional to the actual risks. All right, we're gonna keep moving it on. We're gonna move on. Uh, Congressman, you have this question up first. Uh, we're going on to the economy. Today, the president tweeted that Congress should stop working on a second stimulus package for Americans, even as workers who are unemployed are wanting more benefits to get them through this tough time. At a time when our national debt stands at nearly $20 trillion, should we be granting a second stimulus and should that package come right now, despite what the president says? A minute and a half, sir. Yeah, great question. Look, uh, the national debt's over $26 trillion, frankly which is, you know, an order of magnitude, but still, uh, you know, it not compassionate to bankrupt America. And we should be clear that the $4 trillion that has already been 
provided to stabilize and stimulate our economy, uh, A, it's been burnt up in a lot of cases, but B, there's a lot of it that hasn't been spent. So that's why in May and June, we've started working on the Flexibility for States and Localities Act. I talked to the governor, uh, the treasurer, the auditor, numerous state legislatures, and you talk to school superintendents, uh, county elected officials, they all have more dollars than they can use without changes to the law because their COVID direct expenses have not been as big as they feared. So this bill has support from uh, the Township Association and the Municipal League. It's got support from a uh, broad coalition of folks and it's likely to be incorporated in a deal. That's why I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to move it as a standalone bill. It's not controversial, but frankly, Speaker Pelosi wants to hold out for a deal uh, that, that would spend even more. And so things where there are consensus, like the flexibility uh, that's needed around the country, aren't getting a vote because they wanna leverage it for things that aren't gonna pass. Uh, and they might pass the House, but it's on a party line vote. Uh, they have to find a way to get through the Senate, and they have to find a way to get the president's signature. And I think it's been clear that Speaker Pelosi does not actually want a deal before the election. The president finally called that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Enoch, same question to you. You know, Congressman Davidson voted against the CARES Act and against the HEROES Act when 38 million Americans were out of work. Yet, he didn't mind voting to pass the tax scam of 2018 and to put us in $3 trillion worth of debt. I think the issue for the congressman is not about how we spend, it's more about who we give our money to. He didn't mind giving money to his wealthy friends and, and those who didn't need the resources, but when 38 million Americans were out of work, he decided that the CARES Act and the HEROES Act was something that he just simply couldn't vote for. Yeah, so let's be clear what the CARES Act did, and, and did I did support it. There wasn't a recorded vote on that. If you remember, Congressman Massey asked for a recorded vote, and there wasn't one. But it was broadly supported. That's why it was controversial that we even went back to D.C. for it. Uh, but I do think he made the right decision. I think we should have had a recorded vote on it. People would have gone on the record. It's disappointing that we didn't get the vote, but here's the thing. The payroll protection plan helped people, helped over 100,000 individuals in our district stay on payroll stay in their current workplace and keep their current benefits. So it didn't just go to the corporations, it went to the individuals via the corporations. And over 80% over of those loans were under $150,000. So they weren't for big companies. And frankly, to be eligible for the program, you had to have under 500 employees. So these aren't the huge corporations, these are small businesses where they were struggling to stay solvent. Mm -hmm. And without that support, they would have had, even more would have had real challenges. All right. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Dr. Enoch, 30 seconds to rebuttal, and should there be a second stimulus? Um, there should be a second stimulus, and I think that what the president is engaged in is another quid pro quo. The people in America need money and resources to dig us out of the, the damage that COVID-19 has caused, and we cannot forget about the people in all of this. It's not about who supports you, and unfortunately, I think that that's the decision that the president is making. He's making that decision um, even after the Fed has now told us that we're, we're in trouble. You know, our, our economy is in trouble. It's not the time to pull resources from the American people. All right, we're going to move on to our next question. Up next is voting and the election. Dr. Enoch, this question is coming for you. Early voting started this morning across Ohio. More than 2 million absentee ballots are being mailed out to people who requested them, and elections officials are predicting record turnout. But the president continues to cast doubt on whether the election will be fair and refuses to say whether he will accept the results. My question to you both is, will this election be fair? If not, what do you believe needs to be done to fix it? And if it is fair and the president loses, what will you do to ensure a peaceful transfer of power? Dr. Enoch. Look, we've always voted by absentee ballot here in Ohio. This is nothing new. What has happened is the president in installing somebody who would disrupt the postal service, cause disruption in our mail delivery service, which could potentially cause hundreds of thousands of votes not to be counted. That's what would not be fair. Every vote should be counted. Every person who cast a legal vote should be counted in Ohio. 
Congressman? Yeah, great question. And look, uh, elections should be very secure. And how do you make an election secure? You establish things like Ohio has that many states don't, voter ID. You do things like you don't mail ballots to every registered voter, you only mail ballots to people who request a ballot to the address they have on file, uh, and then you match signatures when you receive them. Ohio's system has three ways to vote. Absentee balloting, early in-person voting at your county boards of elections, and uh, you know, in-person voting on election day. We have safeguards that say you can't have a, a ballot counted that isn't postmarked on or before the election day. Uh, all these things that we wanna protect in Ohio are at risk by Nancy Pelosi's uh, proposal to make uh, California's laws the standard for the nation. It would get rid of voter ID, it would mail ballots to every registered voter, it would have ballot harvesting where one person can go collect ballots for everyone that they can find, and then they can turn them in in mass. Not only that, ballots that don't have a postmark on them uh, could be counted after the election day. And these lawsuits are going on around the country, not just in legislation, but across the board, the people pushing for these policies are only from one political party. And you have to ask yourself, why is one party opposed to secure election and one party's working to defend the election? So I think the president's right to be concerned about it. He's right to sound the alarm. And it's disappointing to see so many well-educated people willfully deceive the American people to make them believe that there's not a difference between what he's talking about in Ohio's much more secure system. All right, the real difference quickly, really matters. All right, quickly to both of you, how will you ensure a peaceful transfer of power assuming President Trump loses? Dr. Enoch, quickly. Um, I think the history of this country has been that there would be a peaceful transfer of power. I would hope that our president, uh, upon losing an election, that he would comply with our regular and normal processes and procedures in turning over power. It's concerning that he has invoked the help of radical groups um, to say stand by and, you know, <laughs> and so it's caused people to make a run on the gun stores to protect and defend themselves. That's concerning to me. So I would, I would just urge the president to make the right decision. All right, Congressman, 30 seconds. And let's be clear, the oath of office is it's important to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And the reality is the president's comment came in the context where our streets aren't peaceful. You already have people violently uh, disrupting day-to-day -day life in cities around America. Thankfully, uh, not as much in Ohio, uh, a little bit in Cincinnati, but they came in context of, the, of, of a, a, a real uh, lack of peace. And frankly, Joe Biden promising, do you think that there's really gonna be peace if Donald Trump wins this election? He's almost guaranteeing that we're gonna protest until we get the outcome we want and not just peacefully. So I think that's the piece. And I do have confidence that uh, if the outcome's clear and not contested or the courts rule and uh, the process is, is, uh, is, is just, that there will be a peaceful transfer of power as there always has been. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next question now. Uh, Congressman, this one goes to you a minute and a half. Uh, we're moving on to police brutality. The topic of police brutality boiled over after the death of George Floyd this year. Our streets were filled with protesters fighting for social justice and police reform. Uh, Dr. Enoch, you were married to a police officer. Uh, Congressman Davidson, you voted against the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that aimed to end racism and racial profiling. Do you believe there needs to be more accountability for police misconduct and trans transparency with police departments across the Ohio 8th District. Congressman. Yeah, absolutely. I believe there should be accountability for individual police officers who commit crimes like the man who, who killed George Floyd. Uh, the reaction to that was universal condemnation. I haven't found a single person who defends uh, the murder of George Floyd. That was, we saw it. Uh, we saw facts afterwards. And look, even in our district, our district, uh, you know, overwhelming support for uh, you know, justice uh, happening, the officers being held accountable, frustration that it took uh, so long to even prosecute them uh, and detain them after the fact. And I think, frankly, people do get the racial component to it, even in our district, which is nearly 90% white. So not the most diverse part of America, but there was broad, overwhelming support. But what happened after that is you had outside agitators seize this moment and work to divide our country. And that's been very disappointing. We had a moment where we could have shared unity and focused going forward. And again, you cited a bill that Speaker Pelosi put on, put on the floor that was 100% partisan. There wasn't a chance to even amend it or debate it. There wasn't even an amendment or debate process in the committee. Now they had a hearing 
but there were no amendments uh, adopted, considered, or debated. And the same thing happened when Tim Scott tried to lead a similar bill through the Senate that was open to amendment and debate. And again, just like so many issues, Speaker Pelosi and the radical left that's backing her and pulling her even further to the left uh, is, is opposed to solving the problem. They want to perpetuate it, frankly, to uh, have election issues like this. It's very disappointing. Congressman, thank you so much. Dr. Enoch, same question to you. Mr. Davidson um, said that he supported accountability. However, he voted against the George uh, Floyd Justice Act of 2020, an act that would have provided the accountability that professionals and law enforcement and attorneys told them would be needed. Um, that would have provided a uh, recourse for people who were mistreated by police officers. It would have taken away qualified immunity. It would have enabled uh, police officers or it would have disabled police officers who acted um, out of course with, the, with policies and procedures to not be able to go to another police department and work somewhere else. But Congressman Davidson, upon hearing all of that testimony, decided that the way to deal with racial issues in our country is to end uh, asset forfeiture. Asset forfeiture was never brought up in those meetings. Although I agree that asset forfeiture needs to end, I also believe that racial profiling and police brutality needs to end. And we need people in Congress who understand those things and who will vote responsibly when those kinds of measures are put on the table. I don't think that anybody across the country watching that who doesn't share those kinds of sentiments approved of what happened to George Floyd. But I do believe that Congressman Davidson has shown over and over again that he doesn't care about the people of this district. He doesn't care about black and brown citizens and whether they are impacted by police brutality. All right, Dr. Enoch, thank you so much. That's your time there. Uh, staying on the same track, uh, we're going on to defunding police. There's been a lot of talk about this around Just the country. Just a minute there, for, because, you know, the, my name's brought up again, you know, inaccurately. Right. I'll give you 30 seconds, then we'll go back to 30 seconds, and we'll move on. Go ahead, All right. Sorry. To say that I don't care about people because of their racial makeup is just laughable. All right, anyone that knows me personally knows that's false. And to say that I don't spend time caring for every citizen in this district, not just the Republicans that vote for me, also categorically inaccurate and a mischaracterization of a vote, that you want to point to a bill that just like, you know, maybe you read the headlines and maybe you didn't read the text of the bill. But the, the reality, when you deal down in the bill, is it really that every single Republican in the House of Representatives hates brown and black people? That's what the far left, radical left talking points are. But that's just not the fact. All right, that's your 30 seconds. Thank you, sir. Dr. Enoch, 30 seconds, and we're going to move on to our next question. The fact of the matter is I did not make this a partisan issue. Mr. Davidson did. I simply said, according to Mr. Davidson's voting record, he does not care about black and brown citizens. We could take, for example, his vote on QAnon, which is xenophobic, racist. Those conspiracy theories are dangerous. Mr. Davidson couldn't find it in his heart or I'm sorry, he couldn't find it in his schedule to vote appropriately on a measure that impacts black and brown citizens, Jewish citizens. All right, that's your time, Dr. Enoch. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Like I mentioned, next question is defunding the police along the same vein of what we've been talking about. Uh, there's been a lot of talk around the country and here locally about defunding police. It's a hot button, divisive topic. Some people feel like the money should be used on rebuilding our, imp our impoverished communities. Others in law enforcement feel like it's a slap in the face to the men and women who put their lives on the line to protect us. Dr. Enoch, you have a minute and a half. Where do you stand on this I'm issue? I'm sorry, you have to repeat the question, please. Yes. Um, uh, defunding the police, it's been, uh, many people want the money to be used for impoverished communities. Others in law enforcement feel like it's a slap in the face. Where do you stand on the issue of defunding police? Okay, first of all, I do not support uh, defunding the police. What I do support is community-oriented policing, um, which many communities across this country have done successfully. I also support law enforcement officers responding to certain types of uh, things, certain types of calls. I think that there's room and opportunity to now change the way we look at policing our communities. 
if there's an issue with a child, for example, a nonviolent offense, a nonviolent child, we don't need law enforcement necessarily to go into those situations. If there's an issue with a mental health patient, there's an opportunity to ensure that there is a mental health professional there that, that can deal with those particular issues. I, as you said earlier, I was married to a law enforcement officer. I certainly don't have issues against police. I believe that we need law enforcement. We need police officers. And as somebody who was married to, to a law enforcement officer, we need to make sure that those officers return home at night. So the issues that we're talking about protect both law enforcement officers as well as the community. We wanna make sure that we keep everybody safe. All right. Congressman, a minute and a half. Where do you just stand on this issue of defunding the yeah, police? Yeah, I'm absolutely opposed to defunding police. I've signed a pledge to, to oppose any measures like that that defund our police. And we have a lot of uh, grants that we give out at the federal government level. And I want to make those grants contingent upon people uh, and departments uh, that, that do defend their communities, that do protect and serve their communities, that do uh, professional training, that do provide in their negotiations a way to hold bad actors accountable, right? Uh, but those are reforms that could pass. Uh, but the idea that you're somehow going to say you're not going to defund police, but you're going to end qualified immunity, so every single law enforcement could be personally sued by anybody that seems slighted, they would have personal liability, risk personal bankruptcy just for showing up for duty. I mean, it's already going to be hard enough to staff our, our police academies and train high quality people who want to go deal with all this to be cops. Uh, so we need to protect our police. We should be defending them and thanking them, not attacking and maligning them. And the way we do that is by holding the individual bad actors accountable, not by painting with a broad brush uh, like has been done. And when you look at the unrest in some of the communities where they've refused to uh, protect the people, everyone in America is protected by our Constitution. Everyone is guaranteed under Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution a Republican form of government, lowercase r. That's not uh, a rule by mob. That's not a peaceful protest that turned into chop like in C Seattle or an endless occupation like Portland. And finally, after three, four months, Speaker Pelosi found it in her uh, will uh, to, to finally condemn people that were violently protesting, that were looting and committing arson. And so it's time that we unite around that. Right, Congressman, that's your time. Thank you so much. Our next topic goes to you. A minute and a half, sir. We're going on to gun violence. Uh, last year, there were more mass shootings than days in the year. That includes the shooting in Dayton's Oregon District, where nine people died and 27 others were injured in 30 seconds. Should we have stricter background checks or sensible gun laws that eliminate the average person buying weapons like the one used in Dayton? Why or why not? Uh, I oppose gun control. I oppose any stricter regulation of firearms. Uh, when you look at what happened in Dayton, that highlights, you know, the thin blue line of heroes that protect and serve our communities. I mean, you look at the response time, it was amazing. You had an evil man take an evil action that killed, uh, that killed people, but could have killed dozens, dozens more. And the police were in the right place at the right time and clearly had the right training to respond to that professionally and capably. Uh, but the idea that somehow uh, every American is somehow doing this. We need to go back to the same principle. The idea that we're going to hold all, we're going to indict all Americans uh, because there are bad actors uh, is, is the wrong way to go about it. You need to have strict punishment for people that commit crimes, and you need to have sound policing to stop it. Uh, you look at the, these were cries for help and warning flags. Almost every time you find one of these mass shooters, you find either gun laws that weren't enforced, or you find. Uh, you find cases where everyone knew, oh, we all knew this guy was crazy. We all knew, like in Florida, uh, all the chances that were given to this. We need to actually have accountability and bring people to justice early on so that it doesn't escalate to the point where there is a mass shooting. All right, Dr. Enoch, a minute and a half. I believe in the Second Amendment. I also believe in sensible gun legislation. Mr. Davidson has spoken of things like accountability, sound policing, but what he doesn't want to deal with is abuse of power. He doesn't want to deal with abuse of firearms and weapons. But the reality is when we have mass shootings in our country, those are absolutely abuses of a privilege. And so we need to ensure just as a child has to be 21 before they walk into a, a movie theater, or I'm sorry, 16, 17 before they walk into a movie theater, 
They have to be 16 and they have to get a license to drive. We regulate things like that, but the congressman doesn't want to make sure that we have sensible gun legislation. Now, I, I'm a woman and I believe in protecting myself. And I believe that there are other citizens who can responsibly do that. But I also believe that we have to have accountability systems in place to make sure that people don't abuse their rights. Thank you. Congressman, I'll give you 30 seconds to reply real quick. Look, safe fire, uh, firearm ownership keeps America safe. And the good news is firearm ownership's going up. And why is it going up? Because people haven't felt safe. They've seen the gaps in the protection uh, from law enforcement. They've seen what mobs do. And uh, they've all, uh, all around the country, seen an increase in firearm sales and an increase in ammunition sales. Because people know that at the end of the day, there's not always a lifeguard on duty. And so they, they've taken precautions. And if you look at the church, shoot, church shooting in Fort Worth, look how swiftly that was t stopped by an armed citizen, well-trained armed citizen. So you owe it to the public to be well-trained if you're gonna own and use a firearm. All right, that's your time, sir. 30 seconds, Dr. Enoch, then we're gonna move on to our next question. I agree with the Congressman that we need to be well-trained to, to hold a firearm, to use a firearm. But I also believe that we need to have sensible measures to protect the public. We need to look at our gun policies. We need to determine which of those policies need to change. We need to determine what we have to do to pr protect citizens. For example, I'm not sure what anyone needs uh, military grade needs to do with military grade firearms. I believe that in protecting citizens that we need to take a look at the things that cause people to fear. That is your time, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next topic will be the opioid pandemic, or opioid epidemic, excuse me. Ohio ranks third in the nation for overdose deaths. Drug addiction is destroying families. What do you say to the mother who is afraid her son or daughter is going to die from an overdose because the drugs are so easy to come by and the treatment is not? What is your solution to this growing problem, Dr. Enoch? Look, we have to have treatment. The opioid addiction is wiping out towns across this country. We have legislators in office that don't want to devote the resources to taking care of our communities. Our rural communities are suffering immensely under this opioid addiction. I had a mother call me and tell me a story about her 33-year-old daughter who died from an opioid addiction. She called me because she felt that the congressman in our district wasn't doing enough and didn't care enough about social issues. Now, I'm a business person, and I believe that we have to take care of business, but we also have to fund programs and f like healthcare. And that's one of the challenges that we have with Congress people who wanna get rid of the Affordable Care Act without having anything in place to, to replace it with. We have to make sure that we have a solid and strong healthcare system in this country to ensure that people who need treatment get treatment, to ensure that people who have COVID-19 get treatment for COVID-19. We need a strong, affordable care, healthcare system in this country. And I think that that's not what we get when we get you know, the kinds of policies that Congressman Davidson is willing to support. We need somebody who will support our communities. Congressman, minute and a half. Yeah, the, look, the opioid epidemic's tragic, and the great news is we were making progress on it prior to COVID-19. Uh, and the horrible news, along with COVID-19, suicides are up, uh, opioid uh, overdoses are up, and use are, are way up, uh, and, and frankly, acts of despair generally. So if you go back to shooting, you look at the common denominator there, just acts of despair. So what's going on in our society that's causing, in the midst of all this, peace and prosperity for our country broadly, what's going on that's causing these increase in acts of despair? And we really do need strong communities to that, and we need, frankly, uh, to you know, increase the, the uh, bonds that bind a community together, not divide communities. You look at you know, the incredible uh, history of our country, and it always involves faith in the communities when our country's been at its best. And we see all the supports for the community being torn down uh, today. So we need to go back to the things that have made America really the world's land of opportunity. And we need to be able to just love our neighbors as ourselves and, and help them. There are programs. Uh, we have a Medicaid safety net. We have a Medicare safety net. 
Look, this opioid epidemic has killed grandparents. There's grandparents that have overdosed in front of their kids. And look, uh, my pastor has a saying that I've never seen more appropriate than when I was watching a child uh, uh, talking to a lady who was helping a foster kid even be ready because his mom had overdosed, right? And it, it just reminded me that, that the saying is, sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go, cost you more than you ever wanted to pay, and keep you longer than you want to stay. This is a horrible addiction. We need to unite to defeat it. And uh, we've made real progress. I look forward to getting back on that path. All right, and that is your time, sir. Thank you. All right, these uh, next questions are single questions. You'll probably have uh, wildly different answers for both of them because they affect you uh, both differently. Um, we uh, go to, I think, uh, Congressman Davidson for this question. Um, Congressman, you've been serving Ohio's 8th District for the last four years. What's one thing you could have done better? You know, I think one of the things I didn't come into Congress really when I first ran for Congress, I wasn't planning to run. So when Speaker Boehner resigned, uh, you know, everyone I talked to was like, wow, it's kind of cool that the Speaker of the House was our member of Congress. But one of the things people had an appetite for was to have a regular member of pre uh, Congress present in the district. And so I think that's been a strength. I've put so much emphasis uh, in the district. Uh, we had a, right around 100 in-person stops during a period of COVID. Uh, I couldn't even tell you how many Zoom calls or phone, uh, phone calls. So the Ohio-based operation has been strong. Uh, we meet with everyone that wants to meet. People say, well, how does somebody wind up on their calendar? They request a meeting. And when they host an event, I come. Uh, and so that's how, that's how we do it. But in DC, I think the, the, the networking that goes on there is kind of a little different than, it's broken. I think everybody realizes that it's broken. Either you think it's great and you wanna go there just to be there, or for most people they run, they say, it's really broken. And I think, you know, the sort of background and skills that I have as an Army Ranger business guy, uh, in my case, for example, could go there and help kind of bring a different sort of experience. Plenty of experience, but a different kind to the table. And I think the networking that goes on there, uh, you know, needs to improve really for, uh, for us to really get everything that we want to get done. Okay, and uh, Dr. Enoch, for you, You've had no career in politics. This is your first time running. Why should your lack of experience not be a concern for the voters of the 8th District? You know, one of the things that I hear across the district from people all across the district is that Congressman Davidson is not accessible. Um, as a Congresswoman, I will listen to the people of the district. My inexperience as a public official I'd have the same amount of experience that Mr. Davidson had when he went to Congress. But what I would do differently is I would listen to the people across the district. What I'm interested in is taking the voices of the community to Washington, D.C. with me. I'm not interested in going there to serve my Wall Street friends and my big donors, my big banks and big insurance donors. I think that's one of the challenges that we've had with our representatives. They have not represented us. That's why I'm running for Congress. We need somebody who can listen to the needs of the seniors and the working families in our district. And that's something that hasn't happened under Mr. Davidson's watch. I think what the, what the people of the 8th Congressional District get when they get me in Congress is they get somebody who will truly stand up, who will fight for the things that they need in Congress. Okay, our next question, 2020, I think a lot of people can agree, has been mostly a year to forget. As a journalist, I cannot remember a year where there's been more hate being slung from multiple groups. Are you willing to reach across the aisle to bring people together, and if so, how would you do it, Dr. Enoch? Absolutely, I was married to a Republican, so I already reached across the aisle, for lack of a better word. Um, I have every intention on going to Cong Congress and making sure that the all of the constituents of the 8th District are served, no matter what their political persuasion. I've already helped veterans in this district, Republican veterans. I've listened to Republican farmers, as well as Democrats and independents. I don't have an issue with reaching across the aisle. That's one of the reasons why I decided to run, because we have a congressman who only serves the needs of a very small portion, and they're not even I was gonna say a portion of our district. They're not even in our district. They are his wealthy donor friends, the insurance companies. They are the big banks, the special interest groups. 
Those are the people who Mr. Davidson has served while he's been in Congress. That's what I would do different. All right, Congressman, a minute and a half to you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And look, uh, I'm a conservative. I'm with the Republican wing of the Republican Party, right? And so the characterization is, well, you know, you're just there to represent the, the red part of the district. The reality is that voters of the district are, are informed voters. We have people that show up, and it's an insult to their intelligence to say that two-thirds of our district in multiple elections have voted for somebody that isn't representing their interests. Uh, I go out and I talk to them. I get great feedback, and okay, I get a fair bit of criticism from some folks on the left. But I meet with people, whether they agree with my viewpoint or not, and I, I listen to their viewpoint, and I make it known. And what that's resulted in is things like my People Care Act, that would introduce a reform to all of our welfare programs, all the means-tested programs with four Republicans, four Democrats. They get a year and a half to work together to do things like in benefit cliffs, to do it in a holistic way that's so hard to do in Congress because it's broken. So in spite of being clear and fighting for my principles on issues uh, like election security, like defending the right to keep and bear arms, like funding our military and defending our police, uh, that sadly have turned partisan, like making sure citizenship matters and we secure our borders, sadly a partisan issue. I've got bills like the one I just introduced this week that's three Republicans, three Democrats. I've got a bill in the Financial Services Committee that's got Eric Solwell, who's a far left person. And I worked with a progressive coalition to defend privacy rights for Americans to help end warrantless surveillance, spying on American citizens without a warrant. That's a bipartisan issue, and we need to get a coalition that can get the reforms across the finish line. All right, now I want to follow up on this. Uh, Dr. Enoch, this will be uh, 30 seconds to you. The 8th District is heavily Republican, so much so that part of it was actually shaved off to make another district stronger for Republicans. Should we restructure Ohio's congressional districts to make them more competitive to encourage more bipartisanship? 30 seconds to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for that question, and absolutely. The district is heavily gerrymandered. In fact, so much so that voters didn't choose Mr. Davidson. Um, Mr. Davidson's people who came before Mr. Davidson chose the voters. And voters across the 8th District are waking up. They're seeing exactly who Mr. Davidson are, is, which is why so many Republicans have contacted me asking for me to advocate for them and who have also supported me. They've supported my run for Congress, both through donations, volunteering. So I, absolutely, I agree. That is your time, ma'am. Uh, Congressman, 30 seconds. To yeah, you. the good news is we're coming up on a, on a census, right? And so every 10 years, that's how our country apportions seats. And uh, in our state, it's done with the legislature, right? So it's not like some special little secret cabal, like, you know, uh, people want to characterize it as. It's an open legislature, so you can hold your legislators accountable. The governor, the secretary of state, and the auditor make up the rest of the team. And we just passed a reform that makes it so that it has to be bipartisan in this next cycle. And it was bipartisan when they drew the current maps. We have five whole counties and a simple third of one other. It's one of the cleanest drawn districts in the state. There are some that I think need attention, and I think it'll get it by, a le by an accountable legislature. All right, that is your time, sir. Thank you. All right, we're moving on. Uh, Congressman, this question goes to you a minute, and a, half, a minute and a half. If you had the ear of the president, what is the biggest issue you would tell him should be addressed here in Southwest Ohio? It's funny you should ask that, because just a few weeks ago, I was on Air Force One when he flew into Dayton, Ohio, and I had the ear of the president. So we were, we were sitting there on Air Force One. He's asking, you know, how are we doing in Ohio? And I share with him some pictures from Fort Recovery, Ohio, a town of about 1,500 in the far north part of our district. And they had a three hour long tractor parade. There's no political organizers, no uh, speeches by political candidates. It's just people that came out, lined the streets, or loaded up tractors and wagons that came out and raved, waved American flags, uh, banners to support the president, pro life flags, back the blue flags and they wanted to just have a rally and a parade in their town to be open. And I think the enthusiasm for the direction of keeping America, America, celebrating this country, not condemning this country. Look, we're not a perfect country, but we're, look, with the hard work and grace of God, this is the best country that's ever existed. And you can tell by the flow of people. More people wanna come into our country than any other country in the world from all over the world. And we welcome them, about a million a year legally. Right? So the idea that we're gonna somehow fundamentally remake this country and, and be ashamed of this country is there. So I think the biggest thing, the president said it in one of his State of the Union speeches, America will never be a socialist country. There's no guarantee of that. 
Ben Franklin said that this is a republic if you can keep it. So if we're going to keep it, we have to choose wisely. And these policies and the candidates and the positions they take really do make a difference. All right, Dr. Enoch, for you, if you had the ear of the president, what would you tell him that should be addressed here in Southwest Ohio? You know, I would almost think that with all of Mr. Davidson's talking points, um, that he was avoiding the question because he didn't directly answer. And I think part of that is because he hasn't listened to the people of the district. The biggest things that need to be addressed in Southwest Ohio are health care, economic development, and job creation. Those are the things that the people across the district have shared with me that are concerns for them. They're not worried about the partisan politics in Washington, D.C. And in fact, they're quite frustrated with that. They're ready for somebody to go to Congress and truly fight for them without regard to party affiliation. And I'm the candidate that, that will do that for them. All right, and now kind Just of a follow up. a rebuttal there to say, look, very quickly, we're tight on time. Characterize that, look, the, jo the economy is the best it's been in generations prior to COVID. The health care plan that passed the House that has modifications from the president's executive action is going to be a great plan and it's going to lower costs. And so we've had those conversations and we also had a conversation about first and foremost, get a good justice on the Supreme Court. I think the president chose wisely to put Amy Coney Barrett uh, as his nominee to succeed Ruth Bader Ginsburg. All right, 30 seconds back to you, Dr. Enoch. You know, prior to COVID, we can't keep living in the past. We're, we're no longer back beyond, before COVID-19. We now have to deal with the issues in our communities, the things that our communities are facing now. Every time you hear the talking points coming from Washington, D.C., they're talking about what happened before COVID. Right now, there are people who are suffering and struggling, and our legislators are talking about not even giving them the resources that they need because of partisan politics and infighting. We have to stop that. We have to have people in Washington, D.C., who understand the needs of the people, the working families, and the seniors in the community, and, and have somebody there who will fight for those things. All right, and a quick follow-up on this. We're gonna talk infrastructure and the Brent Spence Bridge, presidents, senators, congressmen. A lot of people have talked about getting a new one, getting it changed, getting it fixed, but it hasn't happened. Uh, Dave, uh, Congressman Davidson, 30 seconds for you. Brent Spence Bridge, how do we get money for it? Yeah, one of the best conversations I had was with Senator McConnell right after I got elected. And he pointed out that, look, when I was the leader of the Senate, uh, your predecessor, Speaker Boehner, was uh, in uh, the Speaker of the House. Uh, if we couldn't, and Barack Obama campaigned on it, literally had a campaign ad there in 2012. If we couldn't find a way to get the Brent Spence Bridge built, maybe the issue isn't in Washington, D.C. The reality is Kentucky controls a lot of this, and they've been unwilling to do the reforms necessary and make the commitment on the Kentucky side of the road to get that across the finish line. And when I talk to uh, House members and Senate members across the state line in Kentucky, there's a resolve to get that done. I don't know where the current governor stands, but I do know that Bevin was committed to get it done. All right, Dr. Enoch, 30 seconds to you. You know, infrastructure development is one of the greatest challenges that we have in this country and across our district. Our infrastructure is not ready for climate change. Scientists have continually said that we have to do something about our infrastructure. We need to ensure that our sewer systems are ready, our water systems are ready. Already we have flooding across the district as a result of having aged infrastructure. Mr. Davidson's, we can't rely on him to protect our communities and to ensure that resources come back to the communities to do something about our infrastructure issue. We need somebody in Washington, D.C. who will fight for the needs of the people here. We can't continue to travel unsafe roads and bridges. And so the only way we're gonna get those kinds of changes is when we change the legislator, le legislators that we're sending to Washington, D.C. All right, Dr. Enoch, thank you so much. That's your time. And you know, we've been moving quite quickly through this debate, but we have our uh, next, our final question of the evening. Dr. Enoch, uh, this is for you, a minute and a half. We want to end this on a positive note. Over the past few years, both of you have had a chance to get to know each other. You had to introduce, if you had to introduce your opponent at a speaking event, give a toast, something like that. In other words, speak highly of them. Dr. Enoch, what would you say about Congressman Davidson? I would say that Mr. Davidson has faithfully served our country, that Mr. Davidson as a mil as, has been a, had a well-respected military career. I respect those things about Mr. Davidson. I hope that um, other people across the district also respect his service. Um, 
and I, I would I would think that uh, he could continue his service here at home in November um, after the election, and that you know uh, Mr. Davidson will continue to um, do the things that he did before he went to Congress. All right, Congressman Davidson, you have a minute and a half. If you were gave a toast about Dr. Enoch, what would you say? You know, I, I think that she's worked hard. And, you know, hard work is, uh, is a, a characteristic that, you know, so much of the workforce around Southwest Ohio characterizes. People get up and they go to work in the morning or they come in and clock on to another shift and they put the hours in, they work hard, and they're frustrated when they see their neighbors uh, being rewarded for not doing the same. In this period right now, you see people that can't do that and they're frustrated. But the way that we're gonna do that uh, is, is, is to get people back to work safely and I, 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 I'm not sure where my, my opponent stands on that, but I have seen her work hard. And I think the other thing is I would see just the passion that she puts into it. So passion's really good, but I think the, the, the one thing too, she's clearly educated, and I don't know if she's uh, either just only read the headlines and not read the full context, or if she's actually willfully distorting my record or whatever, but it's so much inaccurate that it's disappointing. But I admire her, her ability to earn a great education, to work hard and to put passion behind it. I hope that she continues to do uh, the facts behind uh, that, because facts do really matter. All right, Dr. Nick, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to respond to uh, the Congressman here. Um, I actually pay, pay really good attention to his record. As someone who's running against him, I actually made a decision to run because of his record. Um, it was concerning to me. I felt like the people of the district didn't have a, represent a representative in Congress. And I felt like the needs of our cities and our rural communities across the district, that many of them weren't being served. That's why I decided to run. So I do, I pay attention to his record. I pay attention to the way that he votes. And I encourage the people of the district to also do that as they're making their decisions about who to vote for in November. All right, uh, Congressman, you have 30 seconds to respond. Uh, look, I, I, I think that, look, we have some smart, well-informed voters in the district and they know their values and they know who represents their values. They know who's gonna fight for their values and who's gonna go there and follow orders. And the reality, I've taken some licks in DC because I've been a clear person uh, who is willing to, even, even when we're uh, pushing to make a bill better, to get across the finish line like the healthcare bill or to fight for key provisions in, in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. I mean, they were gonna get rid of historic tax credits and new market tax credits. Well, you look at the benefit of that for a place like Hamilton that's in a major investment that could really dynamically change downtown Hamilton. You gotta have somebody that's gonna go fight for those things, and it's been an honor to fight for it. If you look at uh, Wittenberg University, when they were denied a grant, uh, they reached out to our office and we said, you know, this is wrong. We, we put a coalition together of House and Senate members. We got it reconsidered and we got the grant to that school. And that is your time, sir. Thank you so much. All right, we are gonna move into our uh, final closing comments from each candidate. Each of you gets a minute and a half. Once again, Dr. Enoch, you have the first minute and a half for your final closing statement. Thank you. I wanna thank again uh, WLWT for hosting this debate and for all of you at home who watched the debate tonight. I would encourage you to look at Mr. Davidson's record. Seniors and working families across the 8th Congressional District, you can't depend on Mr. Davidson to fight for you. Mr. Davidson has a stellar military record. He has a great education from Notre Dame, but he doesn't have the heart to serve the people. So if you've heard things tonight about my record, the things that I stand for, I hope that those things will influence you to go and vote, to vote early, to make sure that your vote is counted. You can learn more about me by going to enochforcongress.com. You can donate there on my website. You can volunteer to help our campaign. We're in this to win it. And we can only win it if you go to the polls and you vote, and you vote for me, Dr. Vanessa Enoch. Thank you. All right, Dr. Enoch, thank you so much. Uh, Congressman Davidson, you have a minute and a half. Thank you so much. Just again, my, I'm Congressman Warren Davidson. I absolutely love this country with a soldier's passion. I will fight for you just like I've been fighting to defend our country, defend our values, and make a difference in Congress to solve problems and change the broken status quo. Well, you know who else is doing that? Our president, Donald Trump's done that, and he's delivered time and time again. I really wish every single one in our district could spend time 
with our president, not just the people that voted for him or like him, but maybe even his biggest, biggest critics. You spend time with Donald Trump, you see that he loves our country. You see that he makes you laugh. You see that he's got a humble side. When I shared the story that I shared earlier about Fort Recovery, he's blown away. Who would think that a billionaire from Manhattan would have this kind of support from farm people in, in a small town in Ohio? Just blown away. And this is the great country that we have, but we're not gonna keep this country by staying home. We have to get out and vote, we have to defend our values, and we have to make sure, just like Ronald Reagan said, uh, you know, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. This country must be renewed, and it, the way forward is to go back to the founding principles that have made this the world's land of opportunity. Our brightest days do lie ahead, but we have to choose wise, wisely, and we have to defend our great country against folks who would fundamentally remake it and change it into a very different sort of country. I ask for your vote and your blessing on our country. All right, Congressman, thank you. Uh, Dr. Vanessa Enoch, thank you both so much for being here tonight. The hour went by so quickly, and I know I had a good time asking you guys the questions and hearing you both, uh, hearing both of your answers throughout the evening. We want to remind all of our viewers that early voting has now begun in Ohio. We saw lines all across our area. You can get details on casting an early ballot, in-person ballot, or an absentee ballot, or even voting on Election Day over on WLWT. Com. Well, we are not done with our debates. Next week at this very same time, very same day, we'll be hosting a debate in Ohio's second congressional district between Congressman Brad Runstrup and his challenger, Jamie Castle. For all of us at WLWT, I'm Stephen Albritton. Thanks for joining us tonight.